Director of the center, and I'm going to start out with some basic facts to get us all on the same page, and then we're going to get a lot more important facts uh, brought to you by two guest speakers for today. So I need to grab the clicker. <laughs> so, um, just to get us all going here on the basics of what we're talking about today and why it's important, um, we'll start with this gentleman. Uh, who knows who this guy is? Who can identify the person on the screen? Yes, Mr. Dix? Uh, right, the president of China, the premier, and I've recently learned, I've been saying his name for a while now, and I realize because I have a, a Chinese student in one of my classes, but I've been saying it wrong for a very long time. So, um, <coughs> Dr. Hong, could you tell us, how do we actually say this man's name? <laughs> okay, so there we have it. So, he is the premier. Last name is C. It's very difficult to pronounce for Ryan's. So his last, his first name is Jin Ping. I know it's confusing. <laughs> so he has been in this position since I believe around uh, 2012, and he's going to be in it I think for about another five years or so. So um, this is the gentleman we're working with and thinking about when we think about U.S.-Chinese relations. Uh, of who we're dealing with. And since he came into power, he has pursued a certain agenda that is, uh, is what we're trying to grapple with and how we should respond to it in, the ter in terms of U.S. foreign policy. So, turn it on. We have experts in case I don't know how to do this. Am I doing this right? Or do I? Um. Oh, thank God. <laughs> so, all of this, by the way, everything that's happened so far has been staged. Just so, um, this is the area of the world we're looking at. We're looking at, uh, obviously, Asia, and in particular, uh, we're looking at a part of it that I know prior to the last couple of years I was very unfamiliar with. I suspect many of the people in the room are unfamiliar with, which is the region um, just south of China, and therefore the South China Sea. We all are familiar with Vietnam and Philippines. We're actually looking at the area in between these, company, uh, these countries and just south of China there, and just north of Malaysia. So that region uh, there at the bottom of the south. More specifically, uh, we're looking at this. Uh, this is the South China Sea. As you can see here, there are some island chains. Uh, those island chains are of particular importance as we consider this issue, and that's going to come up a lot in these presentations today in terms of who gets those uh, island chains, who, who can claim them, who can claim what's near them, what's under them in terms of natural resources, who can claim the sea lanes that go by them. This is all of tremendous import. That's going to become clear as we go through this presentation of just how important that is. Everyone can see that that is an island. Uh, can someone tell us why that island is interesting? What is interesting about that? It's, right, it's, it's, uh, it's either wholly or at least partially manufactured. This is an exciting moment in human geography where we are creating islands out in the middle of the sea or building onto them and creating larger pieces of land. And this has been uh, developed by the Chinese government and there are uh, boats in that port. And uh, in general, this is what is happening in the South China Sea. It's not only the island chains are there, but new islands are being built, and those islands are then useful to the Chinese or whoever might get to use them for a variety of purposes. This is another example where you have an island, or a, even a, I guess it's called a K, which is a very small piece of land there in the middle of the water, and then the government of China has taken that and made it into something rather more. So all of that. Is, uh, is useful to think about as we think about what's going on in this region. Obviously, the Chinese government thinks that this region is interesting enough that it's building land masses in order to establish some sort of a, a authoritative claim. Now, if you study international relations like I do, part of why this is all very interesting is because that's what exists right now in terms of the U.S. military presence, which is to say a lot. If you look at uh, how many troops the United States has, for instance, in Japan, has over 35,000 troops in Japan. That's a lot of troops. 
that's a lot of Hiram Townships put together. <laughs> if you look at South Korea, we're over 20, it was 25,000, and you can just go through this region and see that the United States is stationed throughout this region in a very robust way. Even places where the U.S. isn't stationed, like Taiwan and so forth, very tight relations with the United States, and therefore, as China is moving into the South China Sea region to establish authority and claims and so forth, it's doing so in the context of relationships that exist between the United States and these countries, and those countries have certain claims on this region, and so obviously, the United States gets drawn into that. This is not a situation where the U.S. can simply sit back and say, this is not of concern to us. We literally, if you're American, uh, you don't have a choice. You have to engage, and so the question is, how can we intelligently engage? And speaking of that, uh, we have this gentleman to do this for us. Uh, I've been giving a talk at a lot of high schools lately about this topic, because the Garfield Center is going to do a crisis simulation on the South China Sea in the summertime with high school students. And I think I've visited about six different classes, so about 150 students total. Not a single one of them knew who this gentleman was, which is interesting. And in fact, uh, I will say this, uh, but I won't give any names. I visited one high school and one of the social studies teachers had no idea who this gentleman was. So, um, uh, yet, this is the person who's our, obviously our point man for going out and making policy, and of course this is Rex Tillerson, our Secretary of State. And in fact, this is when he was confirmed at the Senate hearings to get his job, and I believe he was making that face when he was asked about what the U.S. would do with regard to this Chinese island building program, and he said something to the effect that the U.S. was not going to allow this to continue, or to you know, Chinese to access this. Now, if, you, if you've been watching the news, uh, you know that, in fact, Mr. Tillerson just finished up a trip to Asia, a trip to China, and he and the Premier of China have agreed to handle this or talk cooperatively and engage in cooperative relations. So, you go from this to that, and probably somewhere in between is where, in fact, things are going to be. And that's, that's really interesting to think about. The United States is concerned about the Chinese uh, expression of power, at least at certain moments, and any given week is making very strong statements against that. And if you're in a position of making U.S. foreign policy, and some of the people in this room either are doing that right now or will be in the future, you've got to think about how to engage with a country that has so much at its disposal in terms of resources and power in that region. So some of this is very familiar to you, but I'm sure it's not a, a surprise if I show you uh, this population chart. Uh, China has 1.3 plus billion people. That's over a billion people more than the United States. That's a lot of people. And uh, that's translating into very uh, impressive economic growth. This is a story we're all familiar with. But if I were to ask you, is the Chinese economy the second largest, the first largest, the third largest, the fifth largest? What is it now? Does anyone know what its rank is currently? So that's a really good answer. It just went to first, didn't it? Yeah. Second. Okay. Both of those are great answers because they're both right, depending on how you look at this. At least the numbers I could get. We might get more recent numbers uh, when we hear from our guests. Uh, if you look at it at GDP, gross domestic product, the United States is a bit ahead. If you look at it at purchase power parity, the Chinese are ahead, and they have been for a couple of years. And these are different ways of measuring economic growth. But if you think about that, and you think the United States trying to maintain itself in this Asian region, as it's done throughout for many decades, and if you have a country whose economy is at least about as equal or thereabouts as the U.S., well, that's really significant. It makes it very tricky. That obviously translates into military capacity. If I were to ask you, what rank is China in terms of nuclear weapons, what would you say? Third, fourth? Anyone think first? No, it's fourth. So uh, it comes right after France, which is often a surprise for people. Last time we checked. And that's a lot of nuclear capacity. That means this is a country that can exert force from a great distance and a great, uh, a great strength. If I were to ask you how many aircraft carriers, which is how you really control a sea region, the Chinese have, how many would you say? One. Yes? Okay, wow, everyone knows this. Thing. Okay, the, the uh, aircraft carrier data. So there you go. At this point, the U.S. is looking really solid, but the Chinese have one. They purchased it from Ukraine. They're building a new one. They're going to have more coming along the lines. And the question is, how does the United States deal with a country that's developing that sort of capacity? So, uh, by the way, I always like to show their aircraft carrier. Just to it. So I'll leave you with this final point so we can hear about this from the people who actually know what this issue really is, uh, which is this point of view from two different characters. 
Um, some of you, this is a recent picture of him, so you might not really know who that is. It's Henry Kissinger, right? He's still there, and uh, he's, he's still going. And uh, he has a theory about how we should engage the Chinese. He's an international relations scholar, a theorist, and his theory is that the Chinese want to establish a near abroad, carve out a sphere of influence, as it were, and maintain that, and as long as the United States allows that to happen, then we can all get on with our lives and there'll be no problem. And that's a very happy scenario, and that's one way of thinking about this. And obviously, if someone studies international relations theory, I think about that a lot. On the other hand, the gentleman at the bottom right, does anyone know who that is? He's actually been a guest here at Hiram for one of these seminars. His name is John Mearsheimer. He's a very prominent international relations scholar. And his talk was, in fact, um, the, uh, was about the future potential conflict between the United States and China. And his argument is that this activity on the, behalf of, on, on the part of the Chinese is the start of a process whereby the Chinese are going to get this area of influence, and they're going to want a next piece of influence, and they're going to want to replace the US in the region, and then they're going to want to make sure the US isn't dominant in other regions. And that's a theory, and that's really interesting. And it's important to take these things seriously, but obviously if we were to follow that through in its logic, well, that's a really scary situation to think about the US dealing with a country that's behaving like that, and how does the US respond? And so we're very, very fortunate to be able to have two guests with us today who will make a career of understanding this issue in its details, who can bring real facts to bear, not just abstract points which are important, but the actual on-the-ground data and can relay it to us in a really thoughtful way. We're going to have one of our Garfield scholars come up and introduce them in a second and give them a full, proper introduction. Uh, before we do that, I want to say thank you to a couple people who made this possible today. First and foremost, as always, a gentleman who couldn't be here today, Mr. Bill Recker, who uh, is such a tremendous supporter, always has been of our program, so great thanks to him. Mr. Mark Logan, a uh, supporter of, in particular, the seminar series, uh, which we all benefit from, so thank you to him as well. Uh, Michael Canty, I don't know if he's here yet, but he will be, uh, who is supportive, and of course, Ted Helmuth, who is not here, who is here, there he is. So thank you, he's the one here, so he gets the applause. So. I also want to make a special mention of uh, Ken Moore, who is somewhere, there he is. Uh, Ken uh, has been a tremendous supporter of the program this semester, uh, in particular for this seminar. He is the reason we found out about it, and then we're able to help arrange to have uh, Dr. Nam come and uh, visit with us, so we're incredibly grateful for that. He also, some of you may know, we just spent a week in London last week examining Brexit, and um, part of the meeting agenda that we were able to establish there was thanks to Ken because of the contacts he had. So I just I want to take a moment here and special applause for Ken Moore, who's just been fantastic. <laughs> Okay, so we are going to have uh, one of our uh, longest serving, in fact, the longest serving ever, Garfield Scholar, uh, come on up, Bishop Sanders, the only one we ever allowed in as a freshman. So um, this is his final and uh, fourth year final event, so he's going to give the introductions, and then afterwards, for those of you, this will go to about six-ish, uh, and 6.15, and then afterwards, those of you who have a dinner reservation, we'll head over to Kortansky Hall for refreshments, dinner, and further chatting. So without further ado, Mr. Hi everyone, as Professor Thompson said, I'm here to introduce our two wonderful speakers. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Nong Hong. She received her PhD of something Hiram loves, Interdisciplinary Study of International Law and International Relations from the University of Alberta in Canada, and then held her postdoctoral fellowship at the university's China Institute. In addition, she has held numerous research fellowships and is currently a research fellow with the National Institute for South China Sea Studies. Her work focuses, uh, also on what Hiram loves, an interdisciplinary approach to examine international relations and international law. Dr. Hong has written extensively on international disputes and settlement and has recently published an article that all the Garfield scholars read entitled, Unclose and the Ocean of Dispute Settlement, Law and Politics in the South China Sea. We are very pleased to welcome Dr. Hong here to Hiram College.
And then our second speaker, we're glad that your plane finally made it here, um, is Bonnie Glazer. She comes to us from the Center for Strategic and International Studies, where she's a senior advisor for Asia and the director of the China Power Project, where she works on issues related to Asia-Pacific security with a focus on Chinese foreign and security policy. Ms. Glazer has worked for over 30 years with the Asia-Pacific geopolitics and U.S. policy. She's been published in a wide range of academic and policy journals from Washington Quarterly to Far Eastern Economic Review and newspapers such as the New York Times. Ms. Glazer is currently a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and has served on the Defense Department's Defense Policy Board China Panel. Please give a warm welcome to our second speaker, Ms. Bonnie Glazer. Especially uh, get through central public leadership, especially for Dr. Thompson and Mr. Amo for having me here. So I was told that I'm going to have 30 to 40 minutes to finish my talk. If I run over time, just cut me all of them. I'm happy to finish them during the Q&A or even after dinner. Uh, so um, I think to briefly go over what I'm going to talk today is I'm going to. Uh, review very briefly what is the original cause for the South China Sea disputes and what are the most uh, recent development in this region, including the level connection activity that's mentioned by Dr. Thomason. And then I'm going to uh, explain from my perspective what is the differences and what uh, bring the divergence between the United States and, and China on how they view the South China Sea issues and also explore whether we actually see some convergence of views through which we can actually see a more cooperative manner between the two countries. And my last point of presentation, I'm going to explain to you what is happening right now in South China Sea in terms of the regional efforts to, on how to solve the problems. So, okay, I'm my height. Uh, is, it, is it clear? Okay, so let me go because when people talk about the South China Sea, yeah, most people will they only refer to what's happening after 2009, or they will maybe bring the story back to 1970 when all these climate states like China, including Taiwan, Malaysia, Brunei, Vietnam, and Philippines start occupying those features. But I would like to uh, go a little bit back to the history because when we talk about the South China Sea history, basically we're talking about the sovereignty claims over the four archipelagos. All these countries, they all have territory claims based on, for instance, China's claims based on their acquisition, territory acquisition principles and the cosmic international law, meaning the first discovery and first occupation and also uh, restriction, uh, effect on restriction, etc. And then, there are two uh, critical years in the history of South China Sea. One is 1933 and the other 1939, because far beyond that, although all these countries are claimed the issues in the Spratly and Parasite uh, archipelagos, but it was in the 1970, uh, 1933 when the French occupied none of the features in the Spratlys. And then it was the first time that China actually sent an pro official protest. And then in 1939, um, because China was lost in the Second World War to Japan, then Japan took over, this, including the Parasol and the Spratlys. And then in 1944, uh, like 1945, when Japan lost in the Second World War, and it was actually in the 1951 San Francisco Peace Treaty that Japan was actually required to renounce those, like including Taiwan, including Parasol, including Spartans. But it was particular in the reason of the San Francisco Peace Treaty actually brought to these issues that we are actually seeing today. Because in the Peace Treaty, Japan was required to renounce those features that it actually uh, had claimed from the during the Second World War, but it was not written clearly to whom, to which country that those features should be returned to. And based on unclear definition, unclear clause of the San Francisco Peace Treaty, that, well, China is also 
like for instance, the Vietnamese claims, they would be arguing that because they are actually following the, because Vietnam is a colony state of French, which uh, occupied the features in 1933. And then the Philippines regard those features as, uh, in international law, it's called terra neurons, meaning that it was regarded by the Philippines that those features, was, they don't have any owner, which is not the case because China actually claimed uh, a territory can own these features back in like many, many years ago through many of the dynasty. So one of the reasons leading to today's ter uh, territory dispute is based on the San Francisco Peace Treaty. And the other, other reason is because, as explained by Dr. Tottenham, we see a lot of very important sea links uh, through the South China Sea connecting the Pacific and the, and the, uh, and the Indian Ocean. We actually see a lot of very important sea links of communication throughout the South China Sea. And certainly you often hear there is a rich natural resources, including the living and non living resources where all these countries are competing for. And the last reason where I actually use the bone to highlight is because I think a lot of disputes arising today is because we have this new international treaty law, which is 1982, the Law of State Convention. So, see, um, because the 90, when 1982, when uh, the Law of State Convention of the 30 year legislation actually was signed, and become effective in 1994, we see a different stories in ocean regimes. For instance, before the Lost Convention, for a little rock um, or a little island, then you only have, even for a country, you can only entitled to camp 12 nautical life territory sea. But when the Laws Convention came into effect, even if you have a small island, and legally, legal island, then you are able to claim not only the 12 nautical life territory sea, you will be able to claim further to 200 nautical life exclusive economic zone and continental shelf, which makes a lot of difference for countries who actually have a lot of even uh, mid-ocean islands which is far from their coastline uh, or continent. And then, looking at this picture, this explains to you what is actually happening now in the South China Sea, because there are about, even in the Spotly, we have around more than 200 little features. Some are very big, some are very small. Some are actually, we see maybe fresh water, some it's very, very tiny, and you can see that as only at like low tide elevation. And then because uh, all these countries, the, all the four, uh, five climate countries, none of them has made very clear on what they are going to regard those features which they occupy, whether they are going to regard them as island uh, or they are regard them as only a, uh, a rock, which is not very clear at this stage. And then, um, and then also because after the Lost Convention came to be in fact, we see a new concept of EEZ, which actually a little counter for the pre-existing historical rights, such as uh, traditional fishing rights based on customary international law. So we see on the one hand, we have countries like uh, China and Vietnam, including also Taiwan, that based their claims not only from the 1982 Law of Convention, but also based on the customary international law to claim, for instance, traditional fishing rights in this region. So we see it's very important to see uh, how to balance the new regime under Law of Convention and also the pre existing regimes under customary international law. And then we have other issues in this region, such as resources management and marine environmental protection and freedom of education, which is uh, uh, it's very it's a very concerning question for countries like the United States and other user states, state key stakeholders in the South China Sea. So let me well, I just spoke a little bit about what has been. Uh, existing in terms of when we talk about the South China Sea. So after 2009, on the one hand, we see those old story, old argument continuing. And on the other hand, because 2009 is a very critical year for if we have any international lawyers in this room, they will understand why 2009 is very important. Because that is the year that uh, United Nations Convention set as a deadline for countries to claim uh, extended uh, continental shelf. 
So the new dimension of the 2009, we see a lot of these coastal states, they started to consolidate the maritime, leg uh, maritime plans based on national legislation. And there are also a new round of uh, debates or public discourse to uh, call for international uh, support actually rise since 2009. And then we also see more and more non-coastal states in increasing interest in this region, including the United States, including Japan and India, that all plan their interest in the South China Sea are based on their concern on the freedom of navigation, meaning they worry that the competing interests from the coastal states might actually hamper the freedom of navigation, which I'm going to explain a little later from uh, why China does not concede that freedom of navigation is a real issue in this region. So, and then to 2013, it's a very important year because that's the year the Philippines has lost uh, patience on bilateral negotiation with China and studied uh, arbitral, international arbitral based on the external own cost. So that is the year we see a lot of very increasing public debate in the media and calling for China to uh, be participating in arbitration procedures. So China's position I think is quite well understood that it does not accept the proceeding proposed by the Philippines and the claims it will not accept and will not abide the, the, the final award made by the arbitrary tribunal. But uh, I'm going to explain why this China's position of this uh, no acceptance and no participation. But before that, I think it's necessary to talk a little bit China is opposed to international law and also to the law of the sea. The reason why I want to add this slide is I think we hear a lot of misleading narration or misleading perception about China's attitude towards international law because China cho chose not to participate in arbitration proceedings. And that is why everyone is pointing at China saying, well, you're not respecting international law and you are party to laws convention. Now you are actually, you are not behaving like a member state of own cross. So let me go over a little bit how China, what is China's attitude or approach to international law. But first of all, let me go back a little bit to like before 1978 and 1949. Well, from 1949, when China was established as PRC, till the year 1978, when China was actually started, uh, its policy of opening up to the, uh, to the outside world. On, during this period, uh, China on the one hand are very critical of its so-called Western international law system, which it consider as only representing the interests of uh, colonial or imperial countries. You know, was determined to the developed countries, including including China. But on the other hand, it also endorsed very much the principles and also the uh, of the United Nations Charter, especially on the sovereignty, uh, uh, equality, and the mutual respect. So during that period, we see a uh, different two different characters in defining Chinese attitude towards international law. And then after 1978, we see a dramatic. Uh, in China's uh, process of participating in the international legal system. So uh, I think from 1978 to now, China has um, joined almost all the intergovernmental organizations and already joined more than 3, 300 uh, 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 international regional conventions. So we see that China has become more and more active participating in making the legal process. And then Chinese also has been very active in the negotiation in the Lofsi Conventions and it actually uh, signed uh, the uh, ratified Lofsi Convention back in 1996 and since then has been uh, through domestic legislation, has made many of its domestic law in conformity with the principle of Lofsi Conventions. And in terms of its state practices of dispute settlement, we see uh, that it has been successfully resolved its land boundary with these 12 uh, countries where they actually have uh, land border issues. And also in 2002, it resolved its uh, maritime deportation uh, with Vietnam through several years of uh, bilateral negotiation. So this is the history 
I want to show you how China's uh, involving attitude towards international law. Then, coming to arbitration, they're also uh, also relevant to how China viewed the third party composite exceptional mechanisms. I think there is a lot of misconception that China does not like third party, does not like to ICJ, does not like to eat lots. But if we look at Chinese uh, uh, activities and its uh, WTO dispute settlement uh, experience, we see that China has been very frequently making use of its resettlement mechanisms on a WTO. But in terms of the South China Sea dispute, because it considered as it's mostly it's on the uh, territory disputes and also it's most relevant to the maritime delimitation. So I think it's very rational for the Chinese leadership to take a second thought on deciding that it's going to leave its very sensitive issues for a third party to decide its fate. Well, that's one of the reasons is finding that China, why China is reluctant to accept the arbitration tribunals and proceedings. So back to the question, uh, what is China's position? Why China opposed to the arbitration proceedings hosted uh, by the Philippines? Based on three reasons. The first one is a very legal issue. It actually questions whether the tribunal <coughs> has jurisdiction or admissibility to hear over the case. Because, to, for instance, China believed that between China and the Philippines, they actually made an agreement through its uh, DOC which means that they agreed to solve the issue through another political document, which is declaration of parties in the South China Sea, meaning that well, without actually the two countries agree to, uh, to facilitate a new mechanism, they have to be bound by the previous political document. And also, China believes there's not enough exchange of views really between the two countries uh, before the Philippines actually went for the arbitration proceeding, because the law, actually, the law of sea convention does say that uh, the two countries before you have enough exchange of views, then you have you cannot go to the third party forum to decide to uh, facilitate a, a case. And also, there is another question about a particular question of Article Two Ninety 